Okay, so in this chapter, this is the title is Fluid Mechanics. And what this is, is uh, we'll apply all the laws of physics that we've learned so far to fluids. Okay. And when we say fluids, we mean both liquids and gases. Okay. Now, <clears throat> gases are about a thousand times less dense, dense than liquids. Okay. So, for instance, uh, the density of air is about one kg per meter cube. One meter cube is about that big. Okay. That's this much air is one kg. 2.2 pounds. This much water is 2,000 pounds. Okay, it's 1,000 kgs. So the density is a little different. But we'll apply those laws to fluids. Okay. Now, again, uh, whenever we study a new subject, we study the simplest case first and then study the more complicated case. Okay. So the first half of the lecture we'll study fluids at rest, okay? And then we'll, once we become experts at that, or <laughs> once we learn some of the stuff related to that, then we'll get the fluid to move, okay? And we'll study fluid dynamics. Okay, so that's the layout. <coughs> okay, so again, fluid mechanics is what we're studying. Uh, now you're familiar with the states of matters, matter comes solids, liquids, or gases. And then there's uh, eventually, you'll learn about plasmas. What are plasmas? Superheated gases. Right, so superheated gases, ionized gases. Okay. That have, uh, and so the atmosphere of the sun is plasma and so on. Okay. All right. <clears throat> solids have definite volumes and shapes and uh, liquids have definite volumes but they take the shape of the container so they can have any shape but you know in general you can't change the volume of a liquid it's hard to compress it okay. a gas on the other hand it doesn't even have a definite volume or shape okay. you can easily change the volume of a gas you can compress it easily and so on <clears throat> so in a solid, the atoms are held in place. Okay, so for instance, here is this atom is right there. You can come back 10 years later and it'll still be there. Yeah. In a liquid, the atoms are constantly moving around. Okay, let's say this atom is over there. You come two seconds later, you don't know where it is. Yeah. And so also in gases. Okay. So atoms in solid are held in place by forces which are modeled by springs here, okay? This atom doesn't move, go anywhere because all these guys are holding him in place. Okay. In liquids also, they're in co close contact, but they can slide over each other. So forces between atoms strongly resist attempts to compress the atoms. So it's uh, very hard to compress a fluid, a liquid, because, because of the interatomic forces. Atoms in a gas move about freely and se are separated by large distances. I'll give you a sense for these distances in a second. Okay. <coughs> so we'll study fluids at rest first, and then in the second half of this chapter, we'll study fluids in motion. So for instance, here is water behind a dam and this fluid is at rest. Okay. And we'll study the property of this water, for instance. <coughs> and what this is showing you is an airfoil in a wind tunnel, for instance, and the air is moving. But this is also relevant to the following. Okay. <coughs> so you can have a plane so I'll just draw airfoil. Yeah. You can have this plane moving in still air at 250 miles an hour. Or 
you can have this airfoil at rest and the wind blowing at 250 miles an hour in a wind tunnel. The behavior will be the same. Okay, it's relative motion that matters. All right, so, <clears throat> so you can either think of this as an airfoil at rest and the wind moving or the airfoil moving in a still air. Okay? So we'll study that. Stop me or ask me questions if you if you feel that I'm going too fast. All right. <coughs> so uh, the first quantity we'll define as density. Density is denoted by rho, its mass per unit volume. <coughs> and pure, for pure substances, it can be a character, characterizing uh, quantity. Okay, so you see here, the density of air at atmospheric pressure is about 1.3 kg per meter cube. Let's look at the density of water. It's a thousand times greater. So when you go from gas to liquids, the density increases by a factor of a thousand. Now let's look at the density of iron, for instance, a solid. That increases by a factor of 10. Okay. So density increased by a factor of 1,000, another 10 in going from solid to liquid. Okay. <coughs> so now density, remember, is mass time divided by volume. And volume, if you have a cube, is a length cubed. Okay, so if the density increased by a factor of a thousand, this will will keep the mass the same. This decreased by a factor of a thousand, so length decreased by a factor of ten. Okay, so what that means is, uh, so let's say, um, okay, so if if this is how big an atom is. And this is a solid. Okay. So when you go from solid to liquid, density decreased by a factor of 10. Cube root of 10 is roughly 2. Okay. So now in a liquid, this is how far the atoms are. Okay. So if in a solid, the atoms are touching, again, this is the rough picture. This is how far the li in a liquid are. And then when you go from a liquid to air, the density decreased by a factor of 1,000. That means L increased by a factor of 10. In air, now the atoms are this far apart. Okay, So that's, that gives you a sense for how far the atoms are. <coughs> okay, now, so we've defined density. The next thing we're going to define is pressure. So here's an object um, immersed in a fluid, and uh, the fluid exerts a force on the faces of the solid. And this force is always perpendicular to the surface. And pressure is given by force per unit area, okay? So pressure is force per unit area. Now, SI units for force are newtons, area is meter square, and so units for pressure are newton meter square, <coughs> newton per meter square. <coughs> and this combination is called a Pascal. <coughs> now, the pressure so how does the fluid exert a force on this face? How's the fluid exerting a force on this face? Well, the weight should be acting downward. Right? 
What's that? And then also, how is it exerting a force on the bottom face? All right, so there's two ways to think of pressure, okay? <clears throat> okay, before I do that, oops. So let me give you... So here's one atmospheric pressure. One atmosphere is 10 to the power of 5 pascals. Okay, so one atmosphere is 10 to the power of 5 pascals. Okay, let's do this. 10 to the power of 5 newtons per meter square. Okay. And, uh, all right, so we'll write this in more familiar units. PSI, 15 PSI. What does this 15 PSI mean? What does PSI mean? Pounds per square inch. So what that means is, so here's roughly a square inch. The atmosphere, the air, is exerting a force of 15 pounds on this thing. 15 pounds. Okay. So to make it a little more uh, concrete, you can take this, <coughs> this entire sheet. This sheet is 10 inches by 10 inches. That's 100 square inch. The force the atmosphere is exerting on this page is 1,500 pounds. Okay, can I have a sheet of paper? <coughs> 10 inch by 10 inch. There's a force of 1,500 pounds on this. So why isn't this flying off? There's an exactly equal and opposite force on this one. Okay. <clears throat> this thing, 10 to the power 5 Newton per meter square, this is a, so we'll write it in terms of mg, okay. So m is, a, m would be 10,000 kgs. times g is 9.8 meters per second square. Okay, so 10,000 times 10 is 100,000 per meter square. <coughs> so, I mean, roughly your chest, you know, it's not quite, we'll say it's a meter square, the area of your chest. So, this is the weight of a bus the weight of a bus is sitting on your chest. And you're not being crushed. What's going on? It's being applied equally and oppositely across all of your body. Yeah, but... Uh, Hmm? Yeah, you are exactly the same thing as this thing. Your lungs are filled with air pressure in the same. Okay. Now, so, so now you encounter this problem. So this is one atmosphere, and we'll see in a second. So this is H two O, and you go ten meters down which is 33 feet. And now, you are at two atmospheres. So now two school buses are crushing you. What do you do? So 
so do not be crushed. Now he had to breathe air at two atmospheres. Okay? You guys understand? You go, go down 20 meters, you have to breathe air at three atmospheres. Okay? <coughs> so the higher the pressure you breathe air at, okay, it, uh, the air mixes in your blood, okay? And then if you come up too fast, all this air would bubble out and collect in your joints, and that's the bends, okay? So you, when you go deep sea diving, you can't come up too fast, okay? All right, so now going back to this pressure, so let's look at the pressure. So you can look at the pressure in two different ways, so let me show you an app. Okay, so we said one atmosphere was 15 PSI. That is the air molecules exerting a force of 15 pounds per square inch. And that's because of these air molecules that are bouncing off that are exerting the force on this wall. Okay, so the air molecule is bouncing off. The walls exerted a force on the air molecule for it to change directions. And the reaction force of the air molecules on the walls is the atmospheric pressure. Okay. So how are these light air molecules? Do you feel an air molecule hitting you? How are they ex exerting 15 pounds of force? There's billions and billions of them colliding every second. Okay? Little grains of sand and little drops of water make the mighty ocean and the vast beaches, okay? All right, so you want to think of pressure. So it's, sometimes it's useful to, I mean, in some situations you want to remember pressure is exerted like that. And you can think of pressure also, okay, so one atmospheric pressure is the weight so one atmosphere is 10 to the power 5 Newton per meter square. That's that much weight sitting on one meter square. So if this is one meter square, one meter square is the size of this table. So if you take this air column all the way to space, this air column weighs that much. This air column all the way to space weighs one school bus. Okay. Okay, so if you're, so if this were uniform density, if you went up halfway, what would be the pressure? Half of an atmosphere. Uh, half of an atmosphere. But you will learn later in this chapter <coughs> that it decays exponentially. So the atmosphere is, you know, limits of the atmosphere is defined at about 10 kilometers. But if you go five miles up, uh, you're already s cross 65% of the atmosphere. Okay. All right. <clears throat> um, by the way, so again, going back to this example, how much force is the atmosphere exerting on this thing? This page of sheet of paper? 1,500 pounds. 10 inches by 10 inches, 100 square inch, 15 times 100 is 1,500 pounds. It's not Newton's, it's, it's pounds? Yeah. Oh, one kg, one kg, which is a unit of mass, is roughly 2.2 pounds. This is a unit of force. This is but. Okay. <coughs> By the way, um, I don't know if so, any of you had signed up to do the Physics Olympics, but uh, it's be, unfortunately been canceled because uh, only two schools had signed up. Yeah. All right, so uh, here's uh, something to illustrate this atmospheric pressure. It's enormous. What this is is a, well, this is a crushed oil tanker. Here's what happened. Uh, <clears throat> so when they transport oil, after it's emptied, they, they have to clean the tanker. And how do they clean it? They steam clean it. So you, you run a whole bunch of hot steam in there and clean it. And somebody cleaned it and uh, 
put the lid on. What happened? At night, the temperature dropped. The steam condensed into water, left a vacuum inside, and the atmosphere crushed it. <coughs> so that's how strong atmospheric pressure is. All right. So you don't want to mess with it. Okay. Okay, so you can think of pressure in two ways. Molecules bouncing off or the weight of this column of stuff. Okay. So now you understand this pressure. Now you understand. So how's the pressure being exerted? It's the water molecule bouncing off. Okay. And the water molecule bouncing off. Okay. So the force is always perpendicular to the area. Pressure is force per unit area. <coughs> okay. All right. Now, if so, if you're there, what is the pressure there? That's one atmosphere pressure. Okay. That's the weight of this column of air. Okay. At that point, it's one atmospheric pressure. So now, if you go deeper in the liquid, now what is the pressure here? The pressure here is the weight of this column of water, air plus this column of liquid. Okay, so the pressure at a depth in a liquid is the atmospheric pressure plus the pressure due to this column of liquid. And like I just we just shared, if this was water, if you go to a depth of 10 meters, this term becomes equal to that term. So you get another atmosphere. So for every 10 meters, you get one more atmosphere. Okay. All right. So, <clears throat> so, and then another way of, like I said, thinking about it is it's the water molecules bouncing off there, applying the pressure, okay, applying the force on, on any surface. <clears throat> So, so for instance, uh, uh, here's a dam, and the dam is storing water behind it. And you just learned that as you go deeper in water, the pressure increases. Okay. The force on this area of the wall, so we'll take this area. The force is pressure times area. So if you keep equal areas, this is equal. But if the pressure increases, the force is increasing. And so you have to make the walls thicker as you go deeper in the dam because this is having to bear greater forces. Okay. So this is how dam walls are built. <coughs> okay. And here's another illustration of the pressure increasing. Okay. The speed with which water comes out of a spout depends on the pressure difference. So the speed with which water comes out depends on this pressure difference, P1 minus P2. Okay. And outside, it's just feeling atmospheric pressure. So outside here, it's just one atmosphere everywhere. But here inside, the pressure is increasing. And since the pressure is, difference is higher here, the water comes out stronger. In fact, if the fluid is frictionless, if it had zero viscosity, here's a very interesting fact, the speed at which it comes out will equal the speed at which if you dropped a rock from this height and it fell that, that distance, the rock would be going at the same speed. That's if the viscosity were zero. Okay. Did you guys understand that? Okay. So what, what we are saying is, if you drop a rock, that distance, the speed of this rock and the speed of this water is the same. Yeah. <coughs> All right. <sighs> so we'll define these two terms, absolute and gauge pressure. Okay, absolute pressure at this point was what is the actual pressure. And the pressure at this point in the fluid you saw was at this point it's atmospheric pressure and then this point it's plus the pressure due to the fluid. 
So the pressure at this point is P naught, the atmospheric pressure plus rho G H. Again, rho is the density of the fluid, G is the acceleration due to gravity, and H is this height. <coughs> All right, now we define something called a gauge pressure because if you go by a gauge to measure pressure at a store, what that actually measures is it doesn't measure P, but it measures P minus P naught. Okay? So it measures the actual pressure minus the atmospheric pressure. And so that's why we define a gauge pressure. Okay? So that's what most gauges do. So what is the pressure in your car tires? 32 PSI. 32 PSI. So that's what the gauge measures. So the actual pressure is 32 plus 15. Okay. 47 PSI. Okay. So the absolute pressure in your car tires at about three atmospheres. Yeah. <coughs> All right. Any questions on this stuff? So we've defined really two things. Density, pressure, and then we showed you that for a pressure, for a liquid in a liquid, the pressure increases with depth. Okay. In a liquid, the pressure increases with them. <coughs> okay. Now, so for various reasons, we want to know atmospheric pressure. It turns out that if that atmospheric pressure changes by 2 3%, then you want to get out of town. Okay, you're getting bad weather. <coughs> right, so we of course, so again, let me, so in this, let's say this is water. At the surface of the water, the pressure is one atmosphere. How deep do you have to go to get two atmospheres? 33 feet, 10 meters, okay? <coughs> All right, so here's a barometer. So essentially what a barometer is, okay, so this is, this is mercury. Uh, mercury has a density of 13.6 grams per cc. Uh, water has a density of one gram per cc, so it's 13 times more dense. Okay. So what this is essentially is, okay, this is perfect vacuum. Okay, this is as good a vacuum as you'll get. Okay. And I'll show you in a, tell you in a second what, uh, how to get that. But you guys know a scale. How do you balance a scale? If you have 100 grams here, you have to put 100 grams there to balance it. Okay. So what a barometer is doing is this column of mercury that's the weight of this column of mercury, is balancing a column of air all the way to space of equal area of cross-section. Okay, that's essentially what a barometer is doing. Did you guys understand that? Okay. So to make a barometer, what you do is uh, you take a tube like this, fill it with mercury, Hold your thumb on top of that and invert it in a, in a tank of mercury. Okay? And you have a barometer. And what ha it turns out, because of the density of mercury, this column of air is balanced by a mercury column of 76 centimeters. Okay? And so... This 0.76 meter of uh, meter of Hg mercury is one atmosphere. Have you guys seen these things in uh, in chemistry labs? Yes. No. Yep. Yeah. All right. So. If you made a barometer with water, what would be the height of the water column? Of 13 
17 times higher than Mercury. Do you have a specific number? You said 17. Oh, no, no, don't do your calculator. <laughs> we just talked about it. How deep in water do you have to go? 10 meters. 10 meters, there you go. So if you make a water barometer, that would be 10 meters tall. <laughs> okay. So now you know why we why use mercury in the barometer. <coughs> now here's an interesting fact. This barometer is the same as this barometer. This height is 76 centimeters. Okay, so the shape of the barometer doesn't matter. Okay. So pressure is transmitted undiminished irrespective of the shape. Okay. Of course, this is using too much mercury, so you wouldn't make it that, that way. <coughs> All right, so here's an interesting thing. All right, so here's a slab of air. Does air weigh anything? Yes? Yeah, we just said... One meter cube of air weighs 1.3 kgs. Why isn't the slab of air falling down? I hold a piece of paper up. This thing fell down. I'm sorry? Oh, carries out being force being like pushed up from the ground. Is it because the air below is more dense? There you go. So, if this is not falling down, its weight is being balanced by some kind of upward force. Okay. Okay. What is the force on the bottom portion? That's pressure times area. And at the top, if the pressure was the same, then the force would be the same and you wouldn't have a balancing force. So what, since this slab of air is not falling down, now you know that the pressure at the top must be less than the pressure at the bottom. <coughs> okay, so this change in pressure is negative. Okay. All right, and in chemistry classes, you've learned that uh, PV equal to NRT, Okay, this is the ideal gas law, P equal to N over V or T. Okay, so since pressure decreases with height, we'll assume that the temperature is not changing. That means the density, number density of air decreases with height. Okay, so we'll do a simple model where the temperature is constant. That is not true, but you know, as a first approximation, we'll assume that <coughs> if you had a constant air temperature, what you learn is the density of air decreases exponentially. Okay. So this is the force at the bottom. This is the force at the top. This minus this must equal the weight of this slab of air. Okay. And if you work that through, okay, so here is the ideal gas law under the and we'll assume that temperature is constant, okay? <clears throat> Under that assumption, if you calculate, this is the number of moles per unit volume at a height y. And what it turns out is this decreases exponentially. Okay, this is the number density at ground level, okay? And e to the power of minus mgy divided by kt. Okay, that's an interesting number. mgy is the potential energy of an air molecule at height y. Okay. And kt, k is the Boltzmann's constant and t is the temperature of the atmosphere. Okay. And uh, you can put in those numbers, air is... Uh, 70%, 78% uh, nitrogen and 21% oxygen. 
And so you can put the weighted average of that for there and put in those numbers. And so what this number is saying is, see, that's 8.8 .8 kilometers. If you go up 8.8 .8 kilometers, if y equal to that, e to the power of minus 1 is, e to the power of minus 1 is 0.35. So if you get 8 kilometers up, the density of air is 35% the density of ground level. Eight point eight kilometers is the height of uh, Mount Everest. So on top of Mount Everest, the atmospheric pressure is thirty five percent the ground level pressure. Yep. Now planes fly at even higher level, higher height, eleven kilometers. So where planes fly, the pressure is about twenty percent ground level pressure. Okay, so what do you have to do if you have, if you want to make sure passengers don't pass out? Yeah, you got to pressurize the cabins. Okay. All right, so, so at about 8.8 .8 kilometers, uh, the density is 1 over E times N naught. In Denver, by the way, the density is 80% 8, 80 that in Daytona Beach. <coughs> All right, so what we have learned is if we assume a constant temperature, we find that the density of air and the pressure decreases exponentially, okay? So similarly, you'll, you can find that expression for pressure at height y will be the pressure at ground level minus E m g y k t. okay? You'll find a similar expression. The pressure will also be. <coughs> because you see, the pressure depends on the number density if this is constant. And if this decreases exponentially, that will decrease exponentially. <coughs> All right, now we'll learn Pascal's law. <coughs> okay, so here's the deal with this law. So let's say we have a tank like this, okay. and this tank is open to the air. What is the pressure at this point? One atmosphere. One atmosphere. And what's the pressure at this point? One atmosphere. One atmosphere. <coughs> let's say uh, this is a tank filled with uh, water. You're 10 meters deep. What is the pressure at this point? Two atmospheres. So one, two. Okay, now we're going to do the following. We're going to put pistons on both of them. We're going to apply a force here. And force divided by this area, at this point, I'm going to increase the pressure by to 1.5 atmosphere. So I went from one atmosphere to 1.5 atmosphere. At this point, I increase the pressure by applying a force. I increase the pressure by 0.5 atmospheres. Okay? And what, what Mr. Pascal realized was, so if you take an enclosed fluid, if you increase the pressure at any point by a certain amount, at every point, the pressure increases by the same amount. Okay, so that went to one atmosphere. What did this go to? 2.5, very good. What did this go to? 1.5. All right, so this is F1. This is A1, A2, F2. <coughs> so here's a device that Mr. Pascal came up with. All right, F1 over A1, that's how much you increase the pressure by, and that should equal the pressure that, that was increased here. 
which is f2 by a2 well f2 is a2 over a1 times f1 all right let's look at this this is magic okay let's say we make this area a2 a hundred times greater than area a1 A2 is 100 times greater than A1. That means F2 is 100 times greater than F1. I apply a 100 pound force and I'm getting an output force of, of 10,000 pounds. Free lunch sounds like. What gives? It'll less. And very good. Okay. So what matters is work in will equal work out. Okay. It, this takes energy to do work, and whatever energy you put in is what you get out. Okay. So and work you will you already know is x. Input force times input distance equal to output force times output distance. Okay, so if this factor gets multiplied by a hundred, this you get move a hundred uh, by a factor hundred less. Okay, so but what is Pascal's principle state? Pascal's principle state. If you have an enclosed incompressible fluid, if you have an enclosed fluid, you increase the pressure at any point in the, in the fluid, the same increase is experienced at every point in the fluid. Okay? So, Pascal discovered that a change in pressure applied to an enclosed incompressible fluid is transmitted undiminished to every other point in the fluid. Okay, so you increase the pressure at this point by that much, the same amount of, the pressure increases by the same amount there, okay? And so this is, okay, this is a simple machine. This is a machine. What is it? It's a force multiplier, okay? So you can take a, apply a small force here, and you get a large force out there, okay? <coughs> And uh, like we said, okay, so if, uh, if A2 is 100 times greater than that, the output force was 100 times greater than the input force, but the price you pay is the output distance is 100th times the input distance. Okay. So again, there's no free lunches. <coughs> All right, uh, let me go back a few slides. Okay, so what is this formula telling you? What is this guy telling you? Okay, this is atmospheric pressure. And as you go deeper into a fluid, the pressure is increasing. Okay. All right, so let's... Uh, Okay, so here's a liquid. Let's just imagine an air bubble or whatever. Okay, so you're this deep in the fluid and there's a certain amount of pressure. If you go deeper, the pressure is higher. Okay, so any volume, because the pressure is de increasing, there's pressure, higher pressure at the bottom, this will feel a net upward force. That's why air bubbles rise in, in, in the liquid. Okay. <clears throat> well, it doesn't have to be an air bubble. It can be a rock. 
the pressure at the top of the rock is less than the pressure at the bottom, so the rock will feel an upward force. Well, why does it sink? Well, this upward force is still smaller than its weight, and so it sinks. Now, if you happen to have an object where the upward force, the buoyant force, is greater than the weight of the object, then it'll rise up. You just saw a bubble will rise up. What else will rise up? I'm sorry? Uh, this water is in equilibrium. What else would rise up? Hmm? Foam. A piece of wood. Foam. So in all those objects, this buoyant force is greater than the weight of the object. So Mr. Archimedes figured out what will rise up and so on. Okay. It turns out that if the density of the material is less than the density of the fluid, then this force will be greater than that force. Okay. So that's the crucial thing. So the density of the material has to be less than the density of the fluid. Okay. <coughs> and Mr. Archimedes gave us, told us how what exactly this force will be, the buoyant force. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Archimedes gave us, and what he said was the buoyant force, this force is equal to the f weight of the fluid displaced by the object. So you, you immerse this object, it's displaced that much fluid, the weight of this fluid is equal to that force. Okay. <clears throat> so the buoyant force so I'll change that. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. That's the density of the fluid. And this is the volume displaced times G. <coughs> so, for instance, so if you immerse an object, the apparent weight of an object in a fluid is its actual weight minus the buoyant force. So what this is saying is if you place a scale on on the bottom and place this object, the weight of this object would be its actual weight, actual weight in air, okay, so there's the actual weight, minus the buoyant force. <coughs> it turns out that our, our density is roughly equal to the density of water, so if you, pay, if you want to lose weight, what you do is you put a scale at the bottom of your spool and stand on that scale. And it'll read zero. <laughs> so. so is buoyancy a fictitious force or is it real? It's real. But it only works in gravitational fields, but it, but it is real, right? Yeah, yeah. In, yeah. So it's a function of uh, where you're located. Yeah. So, okay. Good. I'm glad you noticed that. So, so again, so what uh, Gabriel noticed is the following. So, you saw that the pressure increased with depth. Let's go back to this formula. So, here's what, uh, okay, the pressure increased with depth. What if G were zero? It ain't increasing with depth, so you need a, you need to be in a gravitational field to feel the buoyant force. Okay? Did you guys understand that? Okay. <coughs> All right. Again, uh, Mr. Archimedes told us exactly how much this buoyant force is. It's equal to equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Okay, so here's a little puzzle, uh, well, a little thing I like to do. So let's say this is a lake. Here's a floating dock. Okay. So uh, this is the weight of the dock. And since the dock is floating and it's not sinking, 
the weight of this much water is equal to the weight of this much water is equal to the weight of the dot, right? Now let's say you invite some of your friends over. Now what happens? Okay, so it has to sink. How much does it have to sink? This weight has to equal the weight of these three people. Right? Okay. <coughs> All right. Okay, this is just uh, fun stuff. Okay. Now, this thing is not sinking. So what does that mean? The weight of this guy is being balanced by the buoyant force. So here's an ice cube that's not sinking. It's floating. So the weight of the ice cube, the buoyant force, is equal to mg. And the buoyant force was equal to the weight of that much displaced water. All right, so whenever something is floating, that means that the density of the object is less than the density of the fluid. <coughs> All right, and the ratio of the density, the density of the object divided by the density of the fluid is equal to the volume displaced divided by the total volume. Okay, so that's the dense relationship. So if the density of the object was 60% that of the fluid, 60% uh, of the object uh, would be underwater. Okay. Okay. So, for instance, an iceberg, the density of an iceberg is about 89%, so 89% of the iceberg is underwater. Okay. And that's why the Titanic thing is very, you know, every ship captain knows that 90% of the iceberg is underwater, and it can be any darn shape, you know, and it's sacrilegious for you to run into, into an iceberg, no matter how drunk you are. All right, I think now this is a good point to stop, and uh,